Imagine that you are a sperm, a microscopic cell with an enormous task ahead. You might not realise it, but the feat that you, as a sperm, have to undertake in order to fertilise an egg is nothing short of incredible, and most sperm never come anywhere near. My name is Nicola Hemmings, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher here in the Department of Animal and Plant Sciences. I'm fascinated by the selective process that sperm are subjected to inside the female reproductive tract. My research aims to figure out the characteristics that define the tiny subset of sperm that make it to the egg. Take this sperm for example. This is the sperm of a little songbird called the zebra finch. Its sperm are just over 50 micrometres long. That's really tiny, about a twentieth of a millimetre. But the sperm have a long way to swim. The reproductive tract of a female zebra finch is about 15 centimetres long. And that might not sound very much, but remember, you're viewing this through the eyes of a sperm. 15 centimetres is 150,000 micrometres, 3,000 times your own body length. It's like me asking you to swim 200 lengths of your local pool without stopping. It's also an incredibly treacherous journey for sperm. The female reproductive tract mounts an attack. The fluid inside the tract is viscous and acidic and its muscular walls contract, pushing the sperm around. So to be more accurate, it's more like me asking you to swim 200 laps in gloopy acid with a wave machine turned on and other swimmers trying to drown you. That's what sperm have to deal with, and most of them die trying. Of the hundreds of millions of sperm inseminated, less than 1% make it to the egg. My current research aims to find out if there's anything special about the sperm that make it through. Is there a certain size or shape of sperm that is most successful? Or is it just about how fast they swim? My approach is similar to that of a human fertility clinic. I use a range of lab-based techniques to measure sperm traits. Using a computerised tracking system hooked up to a microscope, I can measure how many sperm in a sample can swim, how fast these sperm are and whether they swim progressively that is forwards, rather than round and round in circles. I can also closely examine the size and shape of sperm and check for abnormalities. Finally, I can take things down to the subcellular level. Using fluorescent probes that interact with different parts of the cell, I can look at the surface membrane surrounding the sperm and the DNA inside the sperm head to see whether they're damaged or intact. I conduct most of my research on birds and there are two aspects of bird reproductive biology that give us a unique insight into the characteristics that define successful sperm. First of all, the tiny set of sperm that survive the female reproductive tract are stored in specialised structures called sperm storage tubules. These are basically pockets in the lining of the female reproductive tract and they allow me to easily identify the selected subpopulation of sperm and look at them in more detail. Second, once sperm reach the site of fertilisation and the ovum is ovulated, a layer of fatty proteins forms around it which traps all of the sperm. If we remove this layer from an egg and look at it under the microscope, we can see all the sperm that were trapped as it formed. This truly is the subset of sperm that, against all odds, were able to make it through the female reproductive tract to the egg. In the last couple of years, I've been developing these techniques in order to diagnose fertility problems in critically endangered species, such as the orange-bellied parrot and Spix's macaw. Many of these species have dedicated captive breeding programs, but reproductive success in captivity is generally low, mainly because a higher proportion of eggs fail to hatch. By examining these unhatched eggs, as well as sperm samples from males, we can identify whether each male is producing sufficient good quality sperm. We can also identify pairs of males and females that are particularly compatible or incompatible. Space and resources in captive breeding programmes is very limited, so it's essential that we choose the best possible individuals to breed. Using these fertility assessment tools, I hope that we can maximise the breeding success of these endangered birds so that we can build up their population sizes and safeguard their future.